Hey, hey, and you can't make a way. Hey, hey, so humble yourself and pray and guard his Torah. Obey each day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hoshiana, Hoshiana. And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, and shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. It's a blessing to be here today. Uh, it's a beautiful day in Calhoun, Georgia. Got, got, it's just a wonderful day you always given us. Amen. Amen. Uh, the name of the message today is called, You Need to Blow Your Atonement. You Need to Blow Your Atonement. Now, today at sunset, we will start observing Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements. And I would like to revisit some of the things that we reviewed on Yom Teruah that are, that's relevant to the Day of Atonements, I believe. At, at first glance, there appears to not be a lot of details about why this day of shouting or day of trumpets in the Torah, but let, let's take a look. Numbers chapter 29. We've got one verse here we want to look at. Numbers, Bimid Bar, chapter 29. I'm going to be reading from the 1998 ISR translation, and we will be on page 174. Numbers 29 and verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you have a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets for you. And then it moves on into, it's just this one verse, it just moves on into uh, uh, telling which offerings were to be brought. And then it moves right into the instructions and offerings to make, be made for the Day of Atonement. Right? Now, let's look together at Leviticus 23, while ye cry. 23, we're going to be on page 130. I'm going to start reading in verse 23. Leviticus 23 and verse 23. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Yisrael, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you have a rest a remembrance of blowing of trumpets, a set-apart gathering. You do no servile work, and you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. That's pretty much all the Torah says about the day of shouting, or the Feast of Trumpets, as it's called. And by the way, the, the Masoretic Hebrew here does not actually say trumpets. It just says teruah. It just says a day of shouting. Uh, teruah means alarm, signal, sound of tempest, shout, shout or blast of war, or alarm, or joy, and as Strong says, especially clangor of trumpets. Interestingly, though, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew, which is 1,200 years plus older than the Masoretic text, calls it a memorial of trumpets. So there you go. The reason that trumpets and, and instruments like that are called horns is because the horn of an animal, especially in ancient times, was the original instrument and design from which the metal horns are patterned. They produce the sound the exact same way. And the shofar or the ram's horn is the instrument used 
by Yisrael in Scripture, which is making all of the sounds that we just mentioned. All right, unless it's the two silver trumpets that were blown by the priests. All right, but a horn can be either an animal horn or a metal horn. All right, the next thing we read about in Leviticus twenty-three is Day of Atonement. All right, so let's look in verse twenty-six. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a set-apart gathering for you, and you shall afflict your beings and shall uh, bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh, and you do no work on that day, same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day shall be cut off from his people, and any being who does any work on the, that same day, that being I shall destroy from the midst of his people. You do no work, a law forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. So why do we have a command for a memorial of blowing or shouting? And could there be a connection between the Day of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement? Right? We always think of a memorial as something that we're remembering in the past, Right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happened in the past, and we'll look at that in just a bit. Yahweh says that if we love Him, He will bless us and take care of us. Hallelujah. I want to take a look at where uh, the very first place in the Scripture is where someone was blowing a horn, and I'd like for us to notice what's going on in this passage, and let's notice who it is that's actually sound in the horn. So let's let's turn together to Exodus chapter 19. Shemot 19. We're going to be on page 76. And by the way, this is where Yahweh makes a covenant with the people and where they make a covenant with Him. Exodus 19 and verse 1. In the third month, after the children of Yisrael had come out of the land of Mitzrayim, in the day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they set out from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Yisrael camped there before the mountain, and Moshe went up to Elohim. And Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and declare to the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Mitzrites, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, notice that it doesn't say casually, now, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation, those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all the words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, here, here y'all say it with me. All that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, see, I am coming to you in the thick cloud, so that the people hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. Moshe reported the words to the pe of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go to the people and set them apart today and tomorrow, and they shall wash their garments, and shall be prepared by the third day. For on the third day Yahweh shall come down upon Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people, and you shall make a border for the people all around saying, take heed to yourself that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall certainly be put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, let them come near the mountain. 
And Moshe came down from the mountain to the people and set the people apart and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be prepared by the third day. Do not come near a wife. And it came to be on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud and the mountain on the mountain and the sound of the what? Ram's horn was very loud and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Right? This is the first place right here that it's, it is ever mentioned and it is where Yahweh is coming to meet with Israel and who's blowing it? We can presume Yahweh's blowing it, or at least it's being blown on his behalf. I mean, all right. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was in smoke, all of it, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain trembled exceedingly. And when the blast of the ram's horn sounded long and became louder and louder... Moshe spoke, and Elohim answered him by voice, and Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go down and warn the people lest they break through unto Yahweh to see, and many of them fall. And let the priests who come near Yahweh set themselves apart too, lest Yahweh break out against them. And Moshe said to Yahweh, the people are not able to come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Make a border around the mountain and set it apart. And Yahweh said to him, Come, go down, and then come up, you and Aharon with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. And Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. Okay. Exodus 20 through 23 are the words which Yahweh spoke to Moshe to give to the children of Israel. And we're not going to read all those today. All right. So we're going to come to chapter 24, verse 1. And Moshe said, Come up to Yahweh, you and Aharon, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall bow yourselves from a distance. But Moshe shall draw near to Yahweh by himself, and let them not draw near, nor let the people go up with him. And Moshe came and related to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the right rulings, and all the people answered with one voice, and they said, What? All the words which Yahweh has spoken we shall do. This is the second time they've said that. All right? And Moshe, verse 4, wrote down all the words of Yahweh and rose up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and Twelve standing columns for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and slaughtered peace slaughterings of bulls to Yahweh. And Moshe took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, What? All that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do and obey. Okay, this is the third time they've said it. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you concerning all these words. And Moshe went up and also Aharon and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Yisrael. And they saw the Elohim of Yisrael and under his feet like a paved work of sapphire stone and like the heavens for brightness. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Yisrael. And they saw Elohim, and they ate and drank. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Come up to me on the mountain and be there while I give you tablets of stone and the Torah. What does Torah mean? It means instruction. That's right. And he commanded, uh, and, and the command which uh, I have written to teach. That's what you would do with instruction, right? To teach them. And Moshe arose with his assistant, Yehoshua, and Moshe went up to the mountain of Elohim. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you, and see Aharon and Hur are with you. Whoever has matters, let him go to them. And Moshe went up into the mountain 
and a cloud covered the mountain, and the esteem of Yahweh dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moshe out of the midst of the cloud, and the appearance of the esteem of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and it came to be that Moshe was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. So, Moshe goes up on the mountain, and he's up there less than six weeks. He is up there for five weeks and five days. And these people forgot what they heard when Yahweh sounded the ram's horn loud and long, and when they made a covenant with him. Then they went back on what they said when they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. All right? Y'all heard it because you repeated it with me three times. Right? All right. Now turn with me to Exodus 32. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. This is where Moshe comes down off of the mountain after being up there a mere five weeks and five days. Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moshe was so long in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aharon and said to him, Aharon, we should go check on Moshe. He might need our help. Is that what yours says? Doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that. And when the people saw that Moshe was so long in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aharon and said to him, Arise, make us mighty ones who go before us. For this, this Moshe, the man who brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim, we do not know what has become of him. And we're not especially finding out where Moshe was either. Interested in that it is. Um, it's pretty messed up, you know it? It's pretty messed up. Verse 2, and Aharon said to them, don't worry, it gets more messed up. Take off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aharon. And he took this from their hand, and he formed it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And they said, this is your mighty one, O Yisrael, that brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Aharon saw and built an altar before it. And Aharon called out and said, Tomorrow is a festival to Yahweh. He called it Yahweh. He called it Yahweh. All right. And they rose up early on the next day. See, they were excited about this. They got up early. And offered burnt offerings and bought, brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, there are some commentators that maintain that this play was erotic play. Right? They don't think it's talking about horseshoes and badminton. Okay? All right? So, the children of Israel, having a very short period of time, broken the first three commands of, of what people traditionally call the Ten Commandments, the three which are specifically towards how man relates to Yahweh himself. All right. What do they do? Well, let's see. They, they, they molded another mighty one before Yahweh. They bowed down to it, and they profaned his name. That's the third commandment. They profaned his name by calling this filthy idol Yahweh. And we can't say for sure, but if this was done on the Sabbath... They broke all four of those. All right? They broke all four of those. And if they're right about this erotic play, they broke the commands regarding adultery and coveting and dishonoring parents and more. Verse 7. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Mitzrayim have corrupted themselves. 
They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and have bowed themselves to it and slaughtered to it and said, This is your mighty one, O Yisrael, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Yahweh said to Moshe, I have seen this people and see it is a stiff-necked people. And now let me alone that my wrath might burn against them and I consume them and I make of you a great nation. Yahweh's really angry here. The, that's, that's the one thing that Yahweh gets angry about, disobedience. He wants to bless us, but here's the thing. Yahweh does not dwell in unrighteousness. All right? Did these people forget what they said when they heard the ram's horn? When they said to Yahweh, all that Yahweh said that we'll do, whatever he says? Yes, they did. Have you ever said to Yahweh, whatever you say I shall do, and then did we forget? Most likely. <laughs> we want to be provided for, but all too often we fail to hold up our end of the bargain. All right. Now, look in Leviticus 25, which, uh, which is two chapters over from 23, where we were reading about the uh, pointed times a little while ago. We're going to be on page 131. While you cry, Leviticus 25, we're going to start reading in verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. And you shall then sound a what? A ram's horn to pass through on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, cause a ram's horn to pass through all your land. Now, remember, we would have just have had a memorial of blowing horns a week and a half before this event, right? Okay. And during the Jubilee, a ram's horn goes through the whole land. Could it be that during this time of release and this time of provision, which takes place on the Day of Atonement, when Yahweh's doing something special for us, that He's wanting us to remember that ram's horn that got blown at Mount Sinai, when we said that all that Yahweh has said we will do. That's just something to think about. Leviticus 25, verse 10. And you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim release throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It is a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return his possessions, possession and uh, return to his possession, and each of you return to his clan, the 50th year is a jubilee to you. You do not sow, nor reap what grows of its own, uh, nor gather from its unpruned vine. It is a jubilee. It is set apart to you. Eat from the field its crops. In the year of the, this jubilee, let each one of you return to his possession. And when you sell whatever to your neighbor or buy from the hand of your neighbor, do not exploit one another. According to the number of years after the Jubilee you buy from your neighbor and according to the number of years of crops he sells to you. According to the greater number of years you increase its price and according to the fewer numbers of years you diminish its price because he sells to you according to the number of the years of the crops. And do not oppress one another, but you shall fear your Elohim for I am Yahweh your Elohim. And I wonder if this next part was just thrown in for good measure or does it have anything to do with the covenant which Yahweh provide provides if we obey his commands. Verse 18, and you shall do all my you shall do my laws and guard my right rulings, and shall do them, and shall dwell in the land in safety, and the land shall yield its fruit, and you shall eat to what? Satisfaction, and shall dwell there in safety. I just have to wonder if if the, the ram's horn going through the land is supposed to be reminding us of something. Did did, did you know that the Day of Atonement's 
actually means a day of coverings. As I said, Yahweh does not dwell with unrighteousness. And you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. Paul said in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the esteem of Elohim. That sort of sounds like he wouldn't be able to dwell with any of us, doesn't it? That's why we need a day to have our sins covered, brothers and sisters. So that y'all wouldn't tolerate us. And he is faithful to forgive our sins and remember them no more against us if we repent. Here's the thing. The fact that we repent does not mean that we are not sinners because we are all, all of us, sinners. All of us are sinners. And without the covering of His forgiveness, we stand before Him cloaked in our filthiness and sin. Right? We need to remember that. We need to remember that. Let me give you some examples. And this, and this part's not going to make you feel very good. You see, when someone commits murder, we have no problem from that day forward identifying them as a murderer because they are. We got that. There are loved ones of the victim who will be victims themselves for the rest of their lives and do without because of this individual's actions. No matter how repentant the murderer is, he's still a murderer. Same thing for a rapist. They're a rapist from then on. They violated someone, and the victim will always have to deal with the horror of being raped. No matter how repentant the the, the rapist is, he's always a rapist. Child molester, same thing. Even though their sin can be forgiven, the sin and the damage from it remain. But what about our own sin that doesn't come under these categories? You see, sometimes there's things that we we don't feel like it's really all that bad. You know, it's not that big a deal. Well, I'll grant you this. Some people will say that if you've broken one, you've broken them all. And in essence, you have because you broke the covenant. You broke the contract with Yahweh, but different sins have different penalties associated with them. Some things you bring a grain offering or a, or a lamb, and other things you get stoned to death. All right, So there, there are different penalties. But sin is sin, and Yahweh can't dwell in unrighteousness. All right? This goes for all of us, self-included. If you've ever stolen anything, guess what? You're a thief. All right? Just like the rapist is still a rapist, you are a thief. You ever lied to anyone? You're a liar. Not about that. <laughs> Not if you're telling the truth about that. But yeah, we're, we're liars if we've ever told a lie. Have you ever struck your parent? You've dishonored your parent. And there's a death penalty for striking your parents. Did you know that Sabbath breaking has a death penalty? Sure you did. All right? If we've ever broken Sabbath, guess what we are? Sabbath breakers. Have you ever committed an act of whoring? A lot of people don't like to think about it. Have you ever been a drunkard? And I don't care which intoxicant either. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's meth, whether it's whether it's marijuana, it doesn't matter. If we've been practicing intoxication in our lives, we're drunkards. See where I'm going here? We are all sinners and we have sin and we all surely have. Now, hopefully we have repented from what we've done. But I think sometimes we can walk around feeling a little entitled. Everything's going to be all right. Maybe we can get a little smug because we're not still out there doing that thing that these other people are. Maybe we're still doing some of the things and, and we hope 
maybe he won't notice me. If we've ever done any of those things, we are still guilty. We're still guilty. There was a lie told. There was a parent struck on and on, etc., etc., ad infinitum. All right. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading verse 8, and we'll be on page 1105. First Corinthians chapter six, verse eight. But you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and that to your brothers. Do you know, do you not know that unrighteousness shall not inherit the reign of Elohim? Why? Because Yahweh does not dwell with unrighteousness. Do not be, be deceived, neither those who whore nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy of gain, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the reign of Elohim. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were set apart, but you were declared right in the name of the Master Yahshua and by the Spirit of our Elohim. I don't tell you this to make you feel bad. I actually tell you this so that you know that we have hope. Because Yahweh will cover us if we repent. I tell you this so that you might have a greater appreciation about what Yahweh is willing to do for His people who deserve death. All right? This is what Yahweh expects when He cleans us up. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 36. And there are other places that talk about similar things. We were reading a week or so ago in Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel 18 where it talks about when the unrighteous turns from their unrighteousness that Yahweh will remember it against them no more. Ezekiel 36, we're going to be reading in verse 19, page 565. Ezekiel 36, 19. And I scattered them among the Gentiles, and they were dispersed throughout the lands. I have judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they uh, came to the Gentiles, wherever they went, they profaned my set-apart name, for it was said to them, These are the people of Yahweh, and yet they have gone out of His land. But I had compassion on my set-apart name, which the house of Yisrael had profaned among the Gentiles wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus said the master Yahweh, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my set apart namesake, which you have profaned among the Gentiles. And as a side note, we who are Nazarenes, we need to make sure that, that we're not profaning the name of Yahweh when we're out there among the nations. All right. Verse 23, And I shall set apart my great name, which has been profaned among the Gentiles, which you have profaned in their midst. And the Gentiles shall know that I am Yahweh, declares the Master Yahweh, when I am set apart in you before their eyes. And I shall take you from among the Gentiles, and I shall scatter you out of the lands that I shall bring you into, and I shall bring you into your land. And... I shall sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your what? Filthiness. From all your idols, I cleanse you. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I shall give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your Elohim. And I shall save you from all your uncleanliness and I shall call for the grain and increase it. And I shall bring no scarcity of food upon you and I shall increase the fruit of your trees and the increase uh of your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of scarcity of food among the Gentiles. Now watch this. He, he's already said said that he would save us from our uncleanliness, and that he was he was going to put his laws in us. All right, and you shall remember 
your evil ways. Read that again. And you shall remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own eyes for your crookedness and your abominations. Not for your sake am I acting, declares the Master Yahweh. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and blush for your ways, O house of Israel. Now why might that be? So that we don't want to do it again. All right? Because if we forget what we've done, we run a high risk of returning to the vomit. All right, look at this one. James chapter 4. Yaakov chapter 4. We're going to be on page 1176. James chapter 4, verse 1. Where do fightings and strivings come from among you? Do they not come from your pleasures that battle in your members? You desire and you do not have. You murder and are jealous and are unable to obtain. You strive and fight and you do not possess because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask evilly in order to spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with Elohim? I just want to interject. I think one of the reasons for the level of greed and promiscuity in this society is because this society encourages both. Right? And people get to where they don't realize what's wrong with either one of them. Whoever therefore, verse, continue on to verse 4, whoever therefore intends to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of Elohim. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? Does the Spirit which dwells in us intensely crave unto envy? But He gives greater favor. Because of this, He says, Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. So then, subject yourself to Elohim, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. Draw near to Elohim, and he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands, sinners, and cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Here he goes again. There it goes. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Master, and he shall lift you up. This is because of the love of Yahweh that He will save us. This is what favor really is. All right? It's what, it's what they call grace in the church, but I don't think they have a good handle of understanding on it. The favor is, is that we, we deserve what? Death. All right? But Yahweh will forgive us and cover what, what we've done if we repent. But this is why we need to be reflective and introspective as this day of coverings for Yahweh's people approaches. We need to realize that we do not deserve mercy. His mercy comes because He wants to show us that He loves us. Right? Oh, and let me tell you this. If while fasting, when, when, we're, when we're thinking about what what Yahweh's doing for us. If while fasting the Day of Atonement, your main concern is your belly instead of your life, you don't understand death and you're focusing on the wrong thing. All right? Now, we should feel good that our tears will be wiped away in that day to come. I'm not, I'm not today going to get into all of the examples to show you how we, you and I, are not alone in this failure. But how many of us here have had failures? This, this should suffice for the time being. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. 
We're going to start reading verse 16 on page 939. Matthew 19, 16. And see, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. You see, folks, that ought to show you that we're all in the same boat. No one is good except one. All right. Matthew 24. Now here's the place where I want to show you that you can have a memorial about something to come in the future. Matthew 24 and verse 29. And immediately after the distress of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then the sign of the son of Adam shall appear in the heaven and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn and they shall see the son of Adam coming on the clouds of heaven with power and much esteem. And he shall send his messengers with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his chosen ones from the four corners of uh, four winds and from uh, one end of the heavens to the other. Do you think that just maybe the reason for that great trumpet sounding is the fulfillment of what happened at Mount Sinai when it was sounded the first time? I think I think perhaps. All right, First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians We are going to be on page 1148 Yeah 1148 First Thessalonians 4 verse 13 Now brothers we do not wish you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you be sad as others who have no expectation for if we believe that Yahshua died and rose again, so also Elohim shall bring with him those who sleep in Yahshua. For this we say to you by the word of the Master, that we, the living who are left over at the coming of the Master, shall in no way go before those who are asleep, because the Master himself shall come down from heaven with a shout. Teruah, I guess it would be in Hebrew with the voice of the chief messenger and with the trumpet of Elohim and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we, the living who are left over, shall be caught away together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so we shall always be with the master. So then encourage one another with these words. So this is the same Paul that we read earlier about uh, who was saying all the terrible things that we've done. All right but also said that we were washed, right? And he's telling us the same thing that Yahshua is saying here, all right? That there's going to be a trumpet sounded, folks. There's going to be a trumpet heard again by the people of Elohim, and I want to get caught up with them. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to be on page 835, and I'll get to read some names. Nehemiah chapter 8, and verse 1. And when the seventh month came, now remember what happens in the seventh month. We have Yom Teruah, we have Yom Kippurim, and we have Sukkot. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered together as one man in the open space that was 
in front of the water gate. And they spoke to Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the Torah of Moshe, which Yahweh had commanded Yisrael. And Ezra, the priest, brought the Torah before the assembly of both men and women, all who could hear with understanding. On which day? First day of the seventh month. That, that'd be Yom Teruah. That'd be when we're supposed to blow, blow a trumpet, right? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? They are shouting. And, and, and what, and what was given to the people the first time the horn was sounded? The, the word of Yahweh. All right. And the word of Yahweh was given to the people then. And, and what's being given to them here on, on, on this day where we got a memorial of trumpets? Word of Elohim. It was given back. On Sinai, I just think that's very interesting. Verse 3, And he read from it in the open space in front of the water gate, and from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people listened to the book of the Torah. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for this purpose. And beside him, on his right, stood Matadiah, and Shema, and Aniyah, and Uriah, and Hilkiah, and uh, Maaseiah, and on his left stood Pediah, and Mishael, and Malkiah, and Hashum, and uh, Hashbadana, Zechariah, Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. All the people stood up. Do, do you do you think these people might have have a reverence for the work of Yahweh and the word of Yahweh? Verse six. And Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great Elohim. Then all the people answered, "Amen, Amen," while lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. And Yeshua and Bani. And Sherebiah, and Yamin, and Akub, and, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseiah, Kelita, Azariah, uh, Yozabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Lewites caused the people to understand the Torah while the people were in their place. And they read in the book of the Torah of Elohim, translating to give the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Lewites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is set apart to Yahweh your Elohim. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah. Can you imagine being so emotionally taken at hearing the words of Elohim because you'd never actually heard them before? Then he said to them, Go, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those whom none is prepared. For this day is set apart to our Yahweh. Do not be sad, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. And the Lewites were silenced, and the people saying, Hush, for the day is set apart. Do not be sad. It's really pretty awesome. When you think about it, the people were, were weeping and being told, do not be sad. Because they were receiving the fullness of Elohim and the provision of Yahweh is coming. All right? So during this time, this time that we're in between the first day of the month and, of course, this evening at Atonements, when the shofar sounded on the first day, let us remember the covenant with our Elohim and just what all He's covering. Because I think I can speak for most of us here. He, he's probably covering a lot. I mean, He's probably covering a lot. But just what all He's covering so that He can make a way for us to be with Him forever is really pretty awesome. It is a memorial of blowing 
when Yahweh came and spoke to his people. It is a memorial of blowing when his son will return to take us home. Think about the significance between Yom Teruah, when we blow the horn, and this next day of Yom Kippurim, the day of coverings. This is the right way to blow your atonement. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete contentment.